Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, actor, musician, playwright, and director, Peter Stormare. And now, Rich Redman. All right, what is up, rock and rollers? Rich Redman here. Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And of course, I'm talking to musicians, actors, comedians, and thought leaders. Today's really special. You know, I, I got, of course, I'm always joined by my witty co-host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. Yeah, you're witty, man. I'll you're be, fast. I'll be a sidekick today. Why not? No, no, no. We want you to jump in. And today, I'm really excited because this gentleman is a staple of TV and film for generations. And <laughs> he, hailing from Sweden, he is an actor, a voice actor, a musician, a playwright, a theater director, our new friend, Pietro Stormare. All right. Had a little Italian <laughs> slant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, my father comes from, I think, Italy. Oh, darn, a guitar fell down on my Oh, back. no, hopefully it wasn't really? a rare vintage guitar. No, it's just a Martin acoustic. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so just a every, Martin. every American host introduces you as Peter Stormare. And yep. now here in Nashville, I'll do my impression. On today's show, Peter Stormare. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so join us. I Joining us from Los Angeles, Jim is in uh, South Nashville. I'm right here on the row in Music City where we crank out country music for the masses yeah. every day. The last year has been a little crazy. Peter, what has this been your – you've got this safe and sanitized thing. Your, your yeah. Instagram is hilarious. Uh, what have you been doing this year? How have you been dealing with this? I, I, I've, I've been lucky enough because I did a, a TV series called American Gods up in Canada. Yeah. And uh, on my way back the first week of March – I flew back and then I landed and we had a lockdown on the 14th of March. I was going back up to do some pickup shoots, but, but that never happened. And then I kept working on my own stuff. I have two series going on, like something called Swedish Dicks. It looks so funny. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> something called the American Runestone, which will come out on Discovery uh, in January. And I have those two series and I, I do some post. I did some post on them. And then actually I was cast in a movie this summer, Michael Bay produced something called Songbird. And uh, that's out now, I think in record time, the Guinness Book of Record. We shot it in August, September, and it premiered 11th of December. So you can go on, you know, any streaming service and buy it. I don't know if it's any good. I don't see my own crap, but... We'll see. And then actually I went over to Sweden to do a movie with some old friends of mine and got some money together. I went over for six weeks and I traveled in a hazmat, goggles, N95, gloves and everything, sitting 12 hours over, you know, to mm. Europe. It's not, it's, not, it's not nice anymore to fly. And, you know, it's no. like you can't go, you can't fall asleep anymore. And you, and I'm just, I'm getting up there in age. I'm, I'm, Devastated because I have so many things in, in the future plan that the next five years is like a plan. I have everything planned out for five more years. What I wow. want to do. So, but you know, you can't plan the future because then it screws you up sometimes. Mm -hmm. But, but I want to do so many things. I don't want to get sick. I'm trying to stay at home and be safe and sanitized. I have double face masks all the time. Yes. I have goggles if I go into a shop and all that. And that I think inevitably we're all going to get sick at one day. And uh, hopefully it has mutated itself down to, you know, just a percentage of what the yeah. virus has been doing now. So, so I just pray for the future. And I, 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 it's like this Christmas coming up. I'm sorry, ranting now, but this Christmas coming up. <laughs> and I talked to some friends and to my family that this Christmas is going to be a, a celebration of solitude and just staying with the family and mm -hmm. not having people over and commemorate and remember the people who have been on this earth before us. Because without their struggle, and they went through a lot, you and I wouldn't be sitting here. We, shouldn't, we, we wouldn't have this talk. And I think today, 
I had this conversation this morning with a couple of people. We forget that we're just here for a, for a little second for things to happen after our visit to Earth. And I think people in the past were more, I don't know, they had more patience. They, they sort of waited it out. They knew they had to fight atrocities, wars and pandemics. And it seems like today we have no patience at all. So yeah. this whole holidays for me is going to be uh, to remember the people who walked on Earth before me. So I had the opportunity to be here and to do music, to play, yeah. direct and act and have, you know, a blessed time of my life to be on this earth sure one day I, i'll go but i the people i thank are are the ones who walked here before me so I sorry that's a, a no that's I really great because it's coming up and and you know i've been very very i got the same call uh, my band was on tour you know we play arenas and amphitheaters and march 13th we got the call that live nation was shutting it down we didn't know for how long and then march 14th i was on a plane to los angeles to see my girlfriend she's a fashion designer so i was like you know if we're gonna quarantine i might as well quarantine with this you know a sexy blonde girl and uh, it, it really made us super tight as a couple because we were had a bi-coastal relationship i would see her two times a month and it went to immediately to 24 7 for nine months and we survived yeah. and it really really deepened our relationship and it was but no man i feel the same way i'm very close with my parents i god bless my parents there my dad is an accountant and my mom was a nurse and um they're still with us and i am driving to florida just got tested today because I don't want to get in on an airplane, get off the airplane and go right to my parents' house. You know, it's, no. too, it's too risky, but Good. my mom is an amazing cook. And so we're going to have a great time, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it's important. It's important also to, to, to pay tribute to, to, to the past, not all the atrocities and, and all the shit that happened, but to, to the people who have made it so we could be here. Sure. Because this planet and is not just made for us, this generation and the couple of generations that are here now. It's we're here for a reason. We're here to lighten the road or the path into the future. Sure. And I think something beautiful will come out of this. Something really good. I know I have a lot of music friends, musicians like yourself, that's been canceled tours, but a lot of them, I mean, we, I've gotten together with my bass player and we have created some great music. We all, I mean, he's poor, of course. He, he's, he, he was out touring too, going in for the summer to do a world tour. And uh, of course, he doesn't get the money, yeah. but please, we create, we do create. Yeah, you know? I, I might know your bass player. I, Cause I remember, I'm looking up, a, I looked up an EPK of your band, the Blonde yeah. from Fargo, BFF, yeah. is that still yeah. what you're performing under that title or no? Yeah, yeah, or my name sometimes when Blonde from Fargo, <laughs> no one knows what it is. Because does but, Teddy Zigzag still play with you? Because he's a pal of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teddy. Yeah, <laughs> so Teddy. who's your bass player? Johnny Gripark, Johnny G, oh. Johnny Hanson. We met one night at the uh, doing a jam at either the Viper or the Rainbow. That's a really yeah. crazy small world, yeah. yeah. Matt Log, Matt Log, also session drummer like yourself. Alanis so, Morissette's Jagged Little yeah. Pill. That's a nice little yeah. feather in his cap. Yeah. 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 So, no, it's the four of us when we get together. And uh, Johnny's back in Sweden taking care of his mother. But when he get back, we're going to, you know, we're going into a studio sitting six feet apart and we, we're going to jam. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was telling Jim, it's interesting the two cultures, you know, living in the two cities. You know, Nashville is if I was look watching CNN today, it's the only state that's bright red because the cases have just skyrocketed and then in I think we're doing okay in California, but the population is so dense that it's terrifying just like even just going out for a run. We don't ha know all the details. It's like when I'm running past someone, is it in the air? Do I have to stop and chat? with them for a certain number of time to catch the molecules it makes you crazy I, and you just want to play it safe you know yeah 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 i used to go up Runyon canyon which is a a, a beautiful park with a yeah. dog park up here on 14 acres in the mountain just a couple of blocks away from me 
And I go up, I, I walk it with a face mask and people take it off and, and then comes a helicopter to take photos and then they shut it down. And I'm telling people up there, you know, please wear your face mask. Otherwise yes. they're going to shut this down. And they give me the finger. You know, it's like, come on. <laughs> You're like, don't shit. I've been entertaining you for three decades, asshole. <laughs> 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 so now but now how did this all start for you because i'm sure some of my listeners i've got a mixed bag of people they're all creative types um using their creativity and hopefully monetizing it in some way jim and i'd like to talk a lot about entrepreneurship and you know treating our career like a business um when did you get to the states how did it start for you it seemed like like how did you catch the bug for the theatrical arts Man, I was born in the countryside. I, I'm born in a little village of like 1,000 people. Wow. One, one movie theater, but th this is a long story. I tried to make it snappy and short. <laughs> when, I, when I was five years old, I somehow crawled up the, the bookshelf on a, on a stool, on a, on a ladder or some chair, my, according to my mother. I picked down the Bible. And I put the Bible under my arm and I start blessing people in my family. And then I walked around my little neighborhood, a couple of houses and knocked on the door and I blessed people. And my mother was very embarrassed. And I went to the Baptist church when I was like five, six years old and nearby, just a couple of blocks in a small village. And my mother or my brother had to come and pull me out because I want to get saved all the time. But at the same time, around five, six, I told my parents they weren't really my parents. My real parents were Californians. And one day I have to move to California and leave you guys here. And they asked me, and according to my mother and father, this I was saying this my whole young life, and they asked me, what are you going to do? I, I don't know, but I'm going to live pretty close to Disneyland and I'm going to work with movies. And that's been the thing with me all my if it's premonition or if it was, if it's a dream or something you tell yourself, but I always knew since I was little, I'm going to live in California close to Disneyland and work with movies, but I never told anybody except my parents. I didn't tell my friends, even when I got older and 20 and getting in seeing theater for the first time in my life, I saw movies. Clint Eastwood was a big star in my life. You know, yeah. I still, he still is. And, but then seeing theater for the first time in my life, I was down in the capital of Stockholm. I saw theater, I started to cry. I couldn't walk out in the intermission in, in because I felt like God had given me a house, a home, finally. So that's how my career started. I think it's, I'm one of a kind because growing up in a small village now covered with snow up in Northern Sweden, and I, I'm one of the few who got out, I guess. But, yeah. but I think it's, it's something that I had a voice within me that's always been leading me. I have a, some kind of a guide that leads me and had done so since I was born. Because some people have called you like, or, and, and you could say this is true or not, but some people call you a medium. Do you, do you identify as that? Because I used to be married to a medium. <laughs> I have I have the ability it's very draining sometimes it's very draining but some people that needs my help I do help like Reiki or no yeah yes yeah, sort of it's it's through prayers and some kind of meditation and hands but I've even been in airports this has happened throughout my life. I've been in airports where I've seated all alone. Usually I try to sit in solitude and I've had people coming up to me and say, you are a believer. I can see there's something around you. Can I ask you a question? And then we mm. start talking about, you know, things that, that are very dear to them. They want, even a guy came up to me in a staircase and he went back and he said, Oh my God, you have a light. I need to ask you a question. He said about my son, he wants to become a musician. And I think, you know, when we started talking and I said, let him be a musician. You can't control his life. Let him have his own path. And he thanked me and hugged me. So sometimes it happens in airports. Whenever you come to an airport and you hear somebody, it's called angels in transit. You hear somebody whistle.
hear somebody whistle in those notes, then you know if someone is calling you, you, you should go up and talk wow. to them. I have never heard that melody. I don't know what that says about me. If I'm a <laughs> no, but it's similar. It's, it could be different too. You know, it could be different. But anybody who whistles in an airport is an angel in transit. Needs your attention. So it probably you playing Satan in Constantine, which is one of my favorite roles of yours, where. Uh he knows he's beaten down, he's tired, and his back is against the wall, and you come and the sludge of hell is dripping off your toes, and you've got the veins sticking out of your neck and these the eye things. And I mean, that's got to be a cool thing when you get the script and it says, well, what, are you, who, what are you playing today? Satan? Satan. Yeah, I yeah, mean, that's, no, a, that, that's heavy. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Jack Nicholson turned it down because he didn't get $5 million to do 10 minutes on screen. And Francis uh, and Keanu and one of the producers suggested me for the part. And I got the part and then they dressed me up in leather pants, bare chested with a lot of tattoos all over my body. And, you know, studs here and you know bracelets here and you know necklaces and stuff and I said no one's going to hear one word of what I'm saying can we please do what we do on stage sometimes just dress me up in a off-white linen suit have me coming down from above instead of raising up have ah. some tar I can shave my eyebrows and shave my head a little bit and shave the eyebrows, make it look kind of creepy and do it in that way. And thanks to one of the producers and the director fighting hard, we got to do it our way. And I think because when you're half naked on stage or, or in a movie, everybody's looking at you and say, he's, he doesn't have the muscles I thought he had. Look, he's getting fat. And they get distracted. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You get distracted. Happens to me all the time. And, and I said also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I said, you know, no one's going to hear a single word of what I'm saying. If I have going to have moving mm -hmm. images all over my body. CGI. So I right. thank you for appreciating because it was a hard fight for two weeks until they said, okay, let's do it this way. Right. And so as your career goes along and you start to, your reputation begins to precede you, I'm assuming that you would have more leeway to suggest to the directors and writers and producers. What about this? What about this? Or what, have you always been that way? Like in the early days where you're just happy to have the job, I mean, you probably just get direct offers now, right? You don't have to go into the room and audition, do you? No, no. The, most of the people in the business no, knows who I am. After 30 years, I, I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> but I always been, since I started in, in Sweden with theater, I've always been, because I've always been a director and an actor at the same time. And as a director, I feel certain things. And, and especially in TV and movies here in the US, people talk too much all the time. Like I'm doing now, talking too much all the time. Yeah. It becomes expositions, you know. They say exactly what they think. And I like to say things that are enigmatic, not exactly, you know, it's, paint, it's a lot of paint by numbers. But even in Sweden, you know, when I started, I had suggestions. Um, I worked with Ingmar Bergman, a legendary director. I had a lot of suggestions to him. And sometimes he took a walk, you know, for one minute around the rehearsal room and came back and said, let's do it your way. That's good. So that's how we grew together and worked a lot together. Because I, I, I just had a curiosity of altering things, not just do exactly what's there in the book. Sure. What if I screw it up a little? Why if I do like this? Well, as a drummer, you know. Yeah, sure. What if I just put a little bit of, you know, syncopate here, you know, let's drive the song in a different way here. And because if you just do the regular thing, it might might just become very bland and very paint by numbers. Sure. Do you find as a general rule that you are sticking to the page or do you, are you working with directors that are like, okay, let's make sure we get one of those in the can and then do give me a couple of takes of your thing. 
Does that happen? Yeah, you, <laughs> usually I talk them down to do exactly to do what I suggest. <laughs> and 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 but most of the writers and, and directors are smart enough, and they know a lot of them know that a creative actor contributes so much more with the heart than someone coming in just delivering even a typo. I've been with in. I'm not going to tell you when, but I've been in situations where an actor actually comes in and says his line and it's a typo. And they say, no, that's not the line. And, and I think, poor actor, you learned a line, it's a typo, and you didn't even have, you know, they don't dare to tell somebody, this got to be a typo, I can't say this. You know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate in this country, it's been like they've been whipped to hit the mark, say the line, get the hell out of there, and hopefully you get a paycheck. Right. And I... I'm not a greedy guy. I have a house. I have one car, but I have no jewelry. I have a couple of guitars. They're very cheap. They look like they're expensive. But some of the things I've collected, <laughs> collected since I was young and have been with me. But it's, I lead a pretty simple life. I've never been in, in it for the money. Sure. I do it for my soul. And, and I try to just, also on a set, I'm there, I think, not just to become an actor or being on a screen. I'm there also to connect with people. Same, same thing as music, right? It's like a high form yeah. of communication. I feel it like is. the language of music, like, like the acting classes that I've taken, uh, I'll have someone say, you can tell you're a musician because you heard the music in the lines. So well, I feel, yeah, there's yeah. a cross-pollination there. It comes handy. I'm, I mean, everybody makes fun of uh, Bruce Willis playing, you know, <laughs> playing in a band, but it's, I think any, like a dancer, they're usually good playing piano, guitar, or whatever instrument, and, and, and musicians are good actors, and actors do have a musical ear. Yeah. You got it, and also you got to be able to sing and perform if someone tells you, you have an offer here to do a musical. You try the best that you have. You know, I've tried the best to whatever I had. I got offered a thing here. I got a part, but then I couldn't do it. But I would love to be in a musical. And I wouldn't say, no, I can't sing. I, I was taking lessons and I got the part. So it, I think the musical ear combines musicians, painters, poets, <laughs> Actors, the best actors do play an instrument. That's it, yeah. That's I yeah. yeah. Jim, haven't you noticed that too? I mean, I feel like I did some research one time, and I was just compiling a list of all these successful actors in Hollywood that play a musical instrument, and it is vast. And many yeah. of them were playing instruments and acting at the same time, and then eventually one of those things like took over. Like, say you worked with Johnny Depp, he moved to L.A. to be a rock star, but got sidetracked yeah. with this this pesky movie business yeah 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 pesky. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and keanu, creativity keanu, begets yeah creativity. keanu plays a mean bass i always tell yeah. i always tell my bass player in my band that he's the most recognizable bass player on the planet and he goes oh yeah. come on man that's not fair <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well that's but telling music, for you yeah <laughs> but the music the music ear is, you know, you got to have it. And, and music is a great healer for a lot of, I mean, a lot of actors, if they don't play an instrument, they have music as an inspiration. I've been on stage a lot and I worked with a lot of people and they lay down before they, you know, enter stage, they lay down, they had headphones or whatever, but they have music. Music calms them down, yeah. concentrate. It's like, like you... Meditate. Mm. The music makes you meditate. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I had my Marcelina coming in. So it's 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 part of being an artist, and also you have to have your curiosity. I mean, I'm not a good player, but I love to hammer the piano. I love to play drums, even if it's sloppy. But I like to, even with Matt. I'd like to, you know, no, I want you, just go up on the hi-hat here, you know, in the chorus, not to the right. Yeah. Just be on the hi-hat. A sloppy hi-hat. 
Yeah, and he says, that kind of odd, but let's try it. And he said, that sounds fucking great. Yeah, I never thought about it. <laughs> so sometimes good ideas comes from people like me that can't play an instrument like super good. Like I'm, I'm pretty good at guitar and bass, and even my bass player, Johnny G, then he says, no, I'll do your bass riff because it's very unusual. It comes from someone who doesn't really play bass. Right. And Johnny is the one who plays lead guitar on most of my songs because he plays a guitar like no lead guitarist plays it. Because he's coming in from a different thought process of playing yeah. bass more often. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he, he hammers down a solo like it comes from mm. outer space and it's not there, you know, like showing up where you can crab walk the neck of the guitar. It comes like from guts. And uh, he's phenomenal good at guitar, you know, to play the guitar and solos. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I looked you up on Spotify, and it was, it's, there's some uh, stuff that's in your native language. And then I looked yeah, you up I'm, on the BFF for the... Yeah, yeah I, I know. I'm, I'm not very good at publishing all my music. And uh, I should do it more. I should collect everything I have now and put it out there because... I don't know what's on Spotify or Pandora or what's out, yeah. out there on YouTube and stuff. And I have a lot of material. It's just I'm going to collect everything and put it out there. I don't, I don't know. Give it away for free. But yeah. I, I, I just love to do. My biggest thing is not to be in front of an audience. My biggest kick is just to create from scratch in a studio. Do you, prefer, do you prefer that, that part of the process more than saying, okay, we're going to go play the Troubadour tonight? Yeah. Yeah, I, it's always been, unless I'm in your, in your band and you have some roadies taking, you know, striking the set and taking care of everything and you can just go home or hang out with the girls or yes. with the boys. But it's always been hard for me to be there and then pack all the stuff and then head home and the adrenaline. Yes. You have to sort of try to kill your adrenaline because you have to go up early tomorrow. You have to go home. Yep. And uh, that's hard at the end of the night, right, Peter? I mean, like yeah. we, we, we get off stage usually when the world is normal. Our show is 9.15 to 11 p.m. And by the time you wipe the sweat off, you know, kibitz with everybody, have a cocktail. Before you know it, it's one, then it's two. And it's like you're just trying to come down from that high of being in front of 20,000 people and sharing yeah. that message, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have, I have maybe 200 or 2,000, but it's, it's, it's enough. My biggest enjoyment is like, for me, it's like, like going, I've, I've been to a shrink twice in my life in New York. <laughs> but, but it, and then I realized the shrink is only, only ball plank with myself. I'm just sending her a ball and she puts it back in my hands and I can take care of this myself. And music being in a studio, I'm working in a collective community with other people and their ideas listen to it and hearing you know something after a couple of days is the greatest healer for my soul that is no no doctor no psych psych psychic or psychological <laughs> psychologist or whatever yeah. have the same healing effect on me it might not be for other people but for me it is sometimes just to strum a guitar and put down a couple of things on a, you know, garage band with, with a click. Mm -hmm. Sure. It is enough for me to, I feel clean, I feel great. My soul is healed <laughs> from all the wounds. <clears throat> yes. Well, I mean, now if people, I just, I, I could have included this in the intro but for the listener that's on the super young side maybe they're a crazy millennial and they don't know about your past but the fact that you have been so busy like everything from the lost world jurassic park to armageddon to minority report the wind talkers constantine i mean you've been working non-stop for 30 years and the people that you're on these films with everyone from like schwarzenegger to goodman to buscemi to nick cage to johnny depp to tom cruise what what Bruce did Willis. you learn all these years working with these personalities and learning the art of collaboration? If you had to write a memoir or tell a young actor some advice nuggets that you got along the way, what would that be? Uh, I, I've always tried to be myself. The first time I worked with um, 
Um, oh boy, uh, with the now you have to cut this out. But uh, Bruce Willis, the first yes. time, yeah. Yeah. the first time I worked with Bruce Willis was uh, was Armageddon, and then we yeah. became friends. But he came in, and we had a scene together, and we had shot for two weeks, and then he came on because he was on another show, and we could shoot some stuff with Bay without Bruce Willis. And then he came on, we had a scene together, and I had the last line in that scene, and he added a line, you know. But in text, you know, I said, we have this thing, you know, my, my uncle have a thing up there, a GPS in the missile, he will find your head and blow up your whole body. And then he said, well, in Texas, we have shotguns, I'm going to take you down. And then I said, but you know, I have another, I have a, another uncle too in Minsk, he can do this and this, and he came up with a new line. And finally he shouted, Michael Bay, Michael, Michael, I got to have the last line. And I said, it's not written that way. Otherwise, the next scene for you will not work, Mr. Willis, because I got out of the last line here. Otherwise, you're not going to get your gas for the thing, blah, 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 blah. I took him on the side and I said, I have the greatest respect for you, but let me have the finish line. It's going to help you in your performance. It's going to help me because you're in my space station and you have to oblige to my rules. Otherwise, you're not going to get what you need. And he looked at me and then he sort of, did this on my face and said, you're right. I was a prick in there. I'm sorry. Let's go back and do it your way. So, and we became very, very good friends. And I really admire Bruce Willis. I admire a lot of actors because they're very sincere. When it gets down to the real business and what you do in front of a camera, being two or three people, when it gets down to, you know, ready, steady, go. We're all nervous. We try to do the best we can. And most of them are, you hear horrible stories about Tom Cruise, you know, Johnny Depp, Bruce Willis, whoever, Schwarzenegger. But I never seen that side of anybody. Yeah. They are very sincere when you, because we all want to do our best in front of a camera. No one walks in there and being an asshole. You, you can have a fit and scream something, but then it takes 30 seconds and then it's like rehearsing with a band. You can yeah. scream and say, you know, you're speeding up, you're speeding up. I'm not speeding up, you fuck. And then, you know, <laughs> and then you just say, well, what's the problem? You know, you solve it in 30 seconds. And with all of these people, I've just seen good things. Sure. I, I've just seen good things and sincere people and, I worked last year with John Travolta. I had two scenes with John, and I admired him since, you know, the mid-70s. Yeah. And he was so anal about getting it right. We rehearsed, and we sat together outside before we started shooting, rehearsing the lines and saying, does this fit? Should I say this? And he's asking me, I'm asking him. So he was really, really keen on doing the best that he could, and myself too, with that two little scenes we had together, instead of just saying to me, you just say yes or no. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the show, you know. I'm yeah. the star. So you stick to your lines and I'm just going to rant. <laughs> no. And most of them know the better the co-star is, the better you get. Right. It's right. You know, Gretzky couldn't win Stanley Cup on his own. He needed guys to pass the puck. Yeah. So, so, he, so he could score. And uh, most of them are, are pretty smart. They know that they need the support of a good cast. It's, it's a creative ensemble. What's your, do you feel like you can over-rehearse? Do you, do you prefer between over-rehearsing and under-rehearsing, which one would you take? I would do under rehearsing because it it, it it just makes it more alive. And and when it comes to music, it's it's harder. It's harder unless you're super super professional and you play together for a long time and super tight. I'm not that good of a musician. Then I need to rehearse. But when it comes to acting, I think I go with the under because it gets more fresh. Sure. And I always tell a director, I like to do the scene, if we do it four or five times, I like to do it four or five times, but each time a little bit different because I'm also love to editing stuff. Growing up with people being editors, 
I know for an editor, it's so nice to have a scene that has a topography that's not, you don't exactly do the same in each take. Are you with me? So the first take is maybe a little slower. The next one is a little bit more angry, but and the next one is more sincere, but fast. So they can pick and choose. So they don't get a flat pizza. They get the topography, you know, and that's what you want in a scene. I you love want that. Music. You want the music in, in, yeah. in a scene. Well, I'm stealing that for my acting, but yeah, because for me as a drummer, a lot of times and now, uh, you know, major studios are dying. And so most musicians have a space where they can record. So like I can literally do a drum track for someone in Newfoundland or Japan or South America, and it's all ones and zeros and it goes through the ma ma matrix and PayPal, boom, it's done. And we're making music together. And so sometimes I'll say, I'll do a super straight, like, down the middle pop radio thing. I'll do one that's maybe a little bit more adventurous and one that's a little crazy and you could pick and choose yeah. and I'll overdub my percussion, yeah. all that crazy stuff. Now, why, do you down, think, why do you think the Beatles went in and they, they did the track like a slower track, a fast track, you know, doing this and speed it up on the tape machine or whatever? Yeah. They just, just so that you don't get caught up of being the same thing all the time. Sure. I mean, a lot of actors and a lot of musicians mm -hmm. become recognized because they can do that guitar solo and they play it forever. And then in Vegas playing that song forever. And the same with some actors, they fall into a trap, which they hate to be in. They have to have the same, same hairdo and the same clothes and the same, yes, yeah, style to, <laughs> to make to make, you know, to make an income. And that, that's a trap for a lot of people too. Yeah. But, but I like the variety mm -hmm. and that's why I do a lot of, if I have the opportunity, I would rather do 20 different things a year than one and make a lot of money on that one. No, I'd rather do 20 and earn less money. Well, that's a, a testament to your the fact that, that why you're such a working actor for 30 years and that work ethic is there and you want to keep bringing that spark and keep reinventing yourself. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. This is The Rich Redman Show. Now, Jim, I got to say, Jim is a massive Marvel fan. He's seen all 23 movies 23 times. Have you? Did I miss any? Were you in any of the Marvel movies? Is that something you'd want to do, a giant green screen uh, space movie? <laughs> I've, done, I've done my green screens enough. And no, Marvel, I, I've been offered one. And, you know, but as a European... And uh, getting older, what you end up with, you, you become the mad professor. You know, you become the mad scientist in a white... <laughs> lab coat. <laughs> yeah, lab coat and some glasses. You walk around and you talk like this and you, you have to have these eggs. In. And I said, no, I'd rather do three independent movies instead. Interesting. And yeah, it's, it's a choice you can do because, as I said, I'm, I don't have a lot of death. I paid off my house. I have one car. I usually use my bicycle and I lead a very simple life. I lead a very simple life. So you it, played a nihilist, but you, in actuality, you're a minimalist. I'm a minimalist. My house, there's nothing on the walls. Everything is, this is crowded out here, as you can see. You yeah. know, so you're, you know, a but, fan, you're a fan of stark white, maybe just a fruit bowl. Yeah, I'm, you know, like a, what do you call it, a sacristy or a Calvinistic church. Yes. My house mm -hmm. inside is old Spanish, two-story, but it's wooden benches, wooden floors, wooden table, nothing on the walls. It's white, you know, stucco outside, inside. It's, it's like being in a church because when I come home, might be the same with you, you know, sitting for eight hours, going like this. When you come <laughs> home, I don't need any noise. I don't want to see anything on the walls. I just want serenity. 
I want peace. Yeah. I don't want anything. I don't want music, no nothing. Just me, maybe an ice cold beer and just breathe. Ooh. What's your what's your beer of choice? Do you like to go heavy and hoppy or do you like to go like American uh, pee pee water? No, I'm 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 more into malt liquor. I like that because it's more like the European Belgium like yeah. stronger beer where the alcohol is between five to seven and a half, you know, five to seven. Yeah, you get your bang for your buck there. Yeah, and because I like the lager, I like Stella, Stella on tap, if you can nice. say that on your thing, but Stella on tap. Yeah. But I always drink it with, um, with the ice. That's, you know, from the Pacific to have ice in the beers so because it's ice cold. I don't like the hippie hoppy because it's, it tastes like drinking bark or eating moss. <laughs> you know, I, I never understood. And I can't get the beer into my brain. It's like down yeah. my stomach. I like I like it. Yeah, I like a Stella or or like Mickey's, you know, ice cold Mickey. Ah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was in a it's a really highfalutin bar in New York City one time and and the top shelf there was some beer that was made by the monks in the mountains and it was like insanely high potent beer and the guys in my band were like rich we dare you to get one of those things so i had one of those things just like drinking like 10 beers and i i missed bus call everyone was like where's redmond and i get the knock on the the hotel door dude where the bus is leaving and i was out wow yeah yeah you, you can't what was that. the alcohol content on that hey, dude it was something like 12 or 13 percent or something insane oh, like barely yeah, legal yeah. But that's, yeah, that's the monk tradition from, from Belgium, Holland, and France, where they yep. brew it, because they had to pass out occasionally, I think. <laughs> Keep the chastity away. That yes. Pass. But no, they, they are a little scary. They are a little scary. Yeah, yeah, they have 12 to 14, 15% sometimes. Oh, my God. Yeah, I bet that's what it was. Well, do you give yourself a junk drawer in the house or not even that? No. Control? No. No, no catch all. I love that. So you're like super organized. And when you come to your, your sanctuary, your, your paid for home, is that where you create your process for prepping for a role? Is it the same every time? Is it different every time? How do you, how do you get into that mindset for your characters? Is it different? You can do it in your car. It's like my father, he, he passed away, but he was an inventor. He, he invented most of his stuff in the car, driving yeah. the car, or you sit in the car. I inherit that from him, but I try to different parts because you, you can't do anything about your nose, your ear. You, you have the same ugly face. <laughs> you have the same ugly face, mm -hmm. but at least you can try to maybe slim down or gain some pounds and walk differently, have some other kind of shoes and your clothes. And sometimes if I have four or five scenes, I usually take scenes and I'm more or less roll a dice, but I say in this first scene, it doesn't matter what it's about, but I said, he had a, he didn't get any sleep this morning or this night, you know, the next scene, he's so fucking hungry. He's in a bad mood. And the next thing is like, I can be, I need to go to the bathroom and take a pee. I'm, you know, so that ah. is, that's underneath, so the only thing sometimes I think I know the lines, but I think about, I, I really need to go to pee. <laughs> you know, that's my subtext. Sometimes. Oh yeah. It creates an urgency in the performance. Cause you know, yeah. you've been in that situation in real life before. Like, Hey, I, I, I it's great to see you, man. Like I really want to catch up, but more yeah. than anything, I got to fucking pee. Yeah. It's, it's small little things that I, I, I just try try to be different whenever you show up. There's a slight difference, and a, a lot come from I think play. I, I like a guy. He's now passed away, but he's a great playwright, English Harold Pinter, and his character was like in in the first act. Joey and Billy was out. You know, could be out in the pub, and Joey says to Billy, "Fancy a beer? All right, then." You get a lager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We drink a beer. Cheers, cheers, Bill. Cheers, Joe. We, you know, they drink beer. And then, like, the third act, after intermission, you come in and Billy and Joe is together again. And Billy says, well, Joe, Joe, I'll buy you a beer. Oh, fuck hell. What do you mean? I don't drink beer. So that's, you know, you don't drink beer, but you had beer before. No, no, you got it. You had to be out with someone else. But as an audience, you know, 
Why is it lying? Is it lying or doesn't he? But it's such an intriguing thing that Harold Pinter said, you always got to have a ferret in the closet. And what he meant by the ferret in the closet, it's got to be something enigmatic that triggers the brain of the audience because the audience can't be told 100% all the time, being spoon fed. Right. The audience has to be given maybe 50 to 60%. And if you're good, they will fill in the blanks. And so you're, and there's, always a, there's always a, a secret that you keep for yourself and yourself alone. <clears throat> yes. And, and we're missing that a lot in, uh, not in the Marvel movies, that's a different genre, mm -hmm. but, but like in regular drama in the U.S., sometimes we forget that people want to fill in with their own fantasy. It's like listening to a great storyteller or reading a great book. You fill in, you know, how, how big was the house? How, how, you know, how beautiful was she? You fill in the blanks. And, yeah. and sometimes old filmmakers said, when you introduce, like Bergman I work with, he said, in movies, usually I introduce a guy coming into an apartment when they open the door, I just have him being seen half his face. So we don't reveal the entire face from the beginning. Hmm. And, and so even, even nonverbal communication, just making a look body language. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing, yeah. You know, no. because it's the more just thinking a thought, right? It's yeah. the thought is yours, but the eyes give away everything. So the camera is on the eyes and it's almost like it is picking up what you're thinking. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Like how no, many I, ways can you say no with just a look? You know, just yeah. looking at the camera and just going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that says it all. Yeah. That nonverbal and, uh, communication. And I, I think the old storytelling is coming back. I, you see it on the most popular on Hulu, Netflix or whatever. <laughs> People are tending to fall into also European drama, reading subtitles and hearing dub material. But it is, mm. I don't say that Europe, the tra tradition in Europe is better or worse because I came here to do movies and I love this country. But I think we've forgotten a little, little bit of what is storytelling about from the beginning. And the movies from the beginning were silent movies. They were five minutes long and they, they were fantastic. People read in whatever into those movies. And I think we have forgotten a little bit about the good old storytelling when the old grandmother sat with the kids and told a story. Yeah. And the kid, kids were all That's fantasizing amazing. and using their fantasy, you know, and there was something dripping in the room next. And they went into the room and they heard the dripping and one, then they saw it's water. No, it's blood. <laughs> done, yeah. done. You know, you know, you know. Hey, Q, Q, and, Dick and, Wolf. Real yeah. um, prose fiction. Yeah. And, and it's, it's uh, that art of storytelling is uh, it's, it's theater of the mind. You know, yeah. That's, uh, that, that was the art of radio back in the thirties and forties. Yeah. You know? Theater of the mm. mind is great. Yeah. And I, then pre, yeah. pre talkies, man, you had musicians that were actually composing on the spot to yeah. the silent films. And you know, what blows me away and I, I, you probably would agree, but I just, how unbelievably talented Charlie Chaplin was that he could do all that comedy. It was like, yeah way before Jack Tripper, you know, but, but it really <laughs> set it all up. And you know what we watched the other night was nope. uh, 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 March of the Wooden Soldiers with Laurel and Hardy. You ever oh. watch Laurel and Hardy? Yeah. We used to watch Laurel and Hardy stuff all the time, and it's, it, it was oh. in color, uh, this particular version, which made it a lot less creepy than it was in black and white. Yeah. But uh, those guys were just true artisans. I mean, just oh, they when they so selling well Christmas time. tree, that what is it called when they're selling Christmas trees and they start beating up the whole house and you know, <laughs> and yeah, they, <laughs> you know, the, Chaplin, yeah. Chaplin is just up the road here, like like two hundred yards away from here, one hundred fifty yards. His house is still there. Wow! Wow! It's like a Hansel and Gretchen house. Yeah, you know, like a, mm -hmm. like a gingerbread. 
Yeah, gingerbread houses. See, and now it's 12 small apartments, but he built it for him and his mother and his brother. And then he walked over the meadows to his uh, uh, studio on La Brea. Wow. You were, yeah. you, you, you know, when we talked about the Marvel movies earlier, it kind of stum, it, it, it sparked a, a reason as to, another reason why I like them. And I realized this as we were talking is there's an unexpectedness to how the actors brought some of those roles to light. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. did a fantastic job Iron with Man. Tony Stark. Yeah. Uh, Chris yeah. Evans kind of, you know, he did a great job with Captain America. He fit, he fit the mold, but it was kind of a predictable role for him. I mean, he was so perfect for it. Uh, Mark Ruffalo as, as David Banner was unexpected. You know, uh, when they brought him in with the Avengers, the first Avengers, you didn't expect it because traditionally David Banner is an angry, angry character which is why the Hulk was born. But the way Mark Ruffalo plays him is very sheepish, you know? Um, and the other aspect of it is the Thanos character, which was introduced at the end of Avengers uh, in a very small uh, post credit scene. He had a sinister type of feel to him. And then they kind of explored the character out over the arc of the other movies, which still had that sinister edge to it. And then Josh Brolin was brought in to play him and it completely flipped the character over. I mean, he was, yeah. I mean, Josh Brolin was robbed of an Oscar playing that, that character. You know, I could see you doing that, you know, uh, I would love, to, yeah, I would love to do something that is character driven. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. I mean, there's like but, Shakespearean elements to those movies. I mean, it's classic yeah, it really storytelling. Is. Yeah. But I think also it's uh, growing up in Sweden, you know, I had I had spaghetti westerns. I had Clint Eastwood, and yeah. we didn't have the comic books of of the Marvels. I, I know my father was a big admirer of Flash Gordon or something, you know. Or, mm -hmm. But we didn't have those comic books. We had more detective stories and other 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 stuff. We we those comic books didn't exist really. Now maybe. They do in Sweden, but when I grew up in the sixties, seventies, they were not there really. Yeah, no. They now, were not planted in my soul from the beginning. Another thing that I noticed, and this is something that that hopefully I can I could steal your answer here, but you have played a lot of villain villains, and you have died a lot. So in Jurassic Park, you were eaten by compies. In Eight Millimeter, you were shot by. Was it the guy from The Sopranos? Was that the, or was it Nick Cage that shot Oh, yeah. No, no. Uh, no. Who kills me there? I, I, I don't remember. It may. So, so. Yeah, and then, James, James maybe killed me. Yeah. I mean, body of proof. You're thrown from a building. The last stand, the governator shoots you. 22 yeah. Jump Street. You, the helicopter gets blown up. So, and all these deaths. I mean, it, it looks like every time you get shot. It's not a standard death. Like your body reacts in a different way. You must have consciously decided, well, this is this kind of gun. Do you go out and talk to cops or research? Like how would that affect your body physically if you're getting shot? No, I just try to do it differently. Talk, talk to the director. <laughs> I've got to die. I'm, I'm dying here. But let's do it in a different way than right. a usual. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's. Can I just yeah. die like in the latest Songbird uh, that is out now with Michael Bay and uh, Adam Mason directing? I I'm going to die with a pen in my neck. And I say, I'm not going to. And the producers wanted me to roll over some table and, you know, have spasms and like, <laughs> like crazy death. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to sit down by an easel where the girl's been painting a lot of red. I'm going to sit there and my blood is just slowly going to come on the canvas down my hand and I'm just going to sit here. Now it's sort of a memorable death. And, yes. and my wow. director supported me, but the producer said, no, we've got to have a spectacular death. And Michael Bay said, let him die the way he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's always easy. That's... go through a... Uh... Fall yeah. off the ledge into a glass table kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's like, the, if, if you watch, uh, what is it, um, uh, Smallville, right? Yeah. They have so many different cliche methods of dying. I don't know how many glass tables have been broken in that show. I mean, <laughs> with people just falling, you know, getting punched and they fall through yeah. a glass table. That's conveniently yeah. placed. And it yeah. only happened like a hundred times. Do you lean on a stunt man or are you always fighting to do your own stuff if you can't? 
I, if I can, it's much better. And sometimes you need a stunt guy because you don't want to break, break it. Or they, they are much better of dying sometimes. But we, we sort of talk. Most of the stunt guys talk about the way you want to die, how, how you want to portray it. And it usually lands on your face <laughs> in the end anyway. But they do the best death. But they always talk to the actor. And I always talk to the stunt guy. I want to die a special way. Because a lot of my characters <laughs> do die, and I'm prepping for my own death. So it's going to be easy to die for me because I know exactly what's going to happen. You've done it so many times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, there's, there's reels on the internet on YouTube, tube, like mashups of your death scenes. Yeah, I, my daughter. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I'm blessed with a daughter. She's 11, and she came. Look, look what I found on YouTube. What is it? You're gonna you get him killed like twenty five times and just uh, don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> don't watch that. That's not real. No. <laughs> oh man. Hey yeah, Jim, but, should we should we try the uh, the uh, fast five questions for the first time ever with Peter? Oh, I didn't know you wanted to. Do I, that. I got no, I got some can. I got some I wrote down. Well, fast five. You want to? And they're all related music? to your, to favorites. Favorites. Okay. I mean, I'm oh, such a I'm well, such you, a fan of ahead. Peter. We'll do the fast five, and then you could do the random question of the day. So, Peter, Sounds without good. thinking, those will be a couple of your favorite things. Favorite food. Sashimi. Favorite city. L.A. Favorite place to make love. Bed. <laughs> <laughs> favorite movie. Uh, uh, Hour of the Wolf. Hour of the Wolf by Bergman, a nice. Swedish movie. Beautiful. Favorite song? Strawberry Fields. Okay. The nice. Beatles and Bergman. I love it, man. That's great. Okay, that's our first time we've done the Fast Five. We'll have to come up with a yeah. jingle for it. Now, Peter, okay. I'm going to pass you off to Jim, who's going to ask you the random question of the day. Cue the jingle. Of the day, Peter. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because I'm, I'm envious of your low register. Yeah, you get really intense, especially All like right. the, like John from Prison Break. Oh right, intensity. All right. Yeah. <laughs> what piece of culture or trend has died out? but you would like to see it make a comeback. I'll ask that again because it was probably too intense. What piece of culture or trend has died out, but you would like to see make a comeback? Radio theater. Nice. nice. I can appreciate that. <laughs> That's coming radio. back a little bit with podcasts because they're doing narrative yeah. podcasts. Yeah, it's, it's coming. It's hard to find though. Yeah. It's hard to find yeah. good stuff. Like but... true crime? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. That will make a comeback. I believe that uh, a lot of the entertainment that we're going to see will be akin to what happened in the 40s and 50s. You'll see that play yeah. in the next 20 years. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Something really cool is going to come out of this. You know, yes. we, we started to get very innovative here, and we have to come up with something. We can't just sit back and say, shit, shit. We have to be... Innovative. Good things come out of discomfort, man. I mean, when you get uncomfortable, that's when you get your back put up against the wall. Yeah. yeah. It's never too late to start a rock band. If you're 72, old, 72 years old, you want to start doing the thing you wanted as a 21-year-old, just do it. Ah, oh, we're getting the motivation right. out of Peter. Yeah. I like that. I but like that. Do it. Open that florist shop. You know, do, do your dream. <laughs> well, hopefully the florist shop will be better than the ones we order from. I, like, I'm almost off ordering flowers online. Here's the deal. You type in flowers on the internet. So the first thing that comes up, 1-800-Flowers, right? And then yeah. you get this picture of this gorgeous, beautiful bouquet. And by the time it gets past, the buckets pass to all the third and fourth parties. By the time it shows up at the door, it's this sad little thing. It's like one-tenth the size. And you got to call and go, that doesn't look like the picture. I want my money back. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. my, in my experience. So Jim does a lot of voice over work. Do you, I, I mean, I've seen you on a lot of cartoons and things like, do you enjoy Video doing games. that? Yeah. Video games. Oh, do, you like, yeah. do you like that as much as the other the camera on Easy camera work, work, man? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it. That's like being a kid, being a doing voiceover to be alone in a studio doing three different characters. You know, it's like hey, get the heck out of there. That's not my. That's not your dwelling. Hey, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do here. This is my place. Get out of there. You know, it's oh. you play. You play with your voice, and they guide you. Usually, they are very good directors in in anime. And uh, it's just good, clean fun. And if, if you do a feature, I usually end up in my skivvies because the air condition can't be on. So it's just... Oh, no. my God, right. <laughs> you have to do like a four-hour session. You end up in that first outfit from Constantine that they put you in and the leather pants and no shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now looking back, you've got this amazing body of work and you have the energy of a super, super young man. So you're, you're nowhere near finished. But if you look back on this body of work, what are some standouts that you say, man, or, or were you saying in the beginning of the interview that you don't watch your own stuff or no? I doubt anybody does in our business. Really? It's, it's no, it's like listening back to music too. You might like the song, but you also hear the mistakes where you should have done it differently. You, you just see your ugly nose, my ugly nose in my ears, and you just see things you don't like. It's like watching yourself on the beach, a photo mm -hmm. from your vacation if you had one. You don't say, wow, I look good. Look at this guy, you know. No, it's, so it's interesting because I, I, I produce a lot of podcasts. And one of the things I tell my clients, I'm like, listen to every episode. That's how you get better in radio. So you can learn what you're doing wrong yeah, and what you want to improve on. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, you course. don't need to do that because you're just naturally good. <laughs> you're, you're, no, you're really good at what no. you do. But of course, sometimes you have to see so you don't have become a mannerism. So you have the same thing, oh. the same ticks going on in each movie, you know. Ah. You have the same. You see that on stage. I do that. Some, yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've been very aware with voiceover stuff that I do that I I'll hear different, you know, different intonations and the yeah. way I land on the, on the end of a sentence and stuff. And I, I, I hear it back and I'm like, I got to switch that up somehow. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's annoying to you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no one else will hear it except for you. That's, that's there's only the so problem. many ways you could say, uh, you know, thank you for calling ABC company, press zero to get to an operator, press yeah. one for so-and-so, you know, <laughs> Which Press is, two to never talk to a human being ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Press so four and you talk to Stormare. Hey, what's <laughs> Peter? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Doing, you talk to Satan. Are you doing yeah. cameo at all? Are you? Have you ever been intrigued by that to try the cameo thing? Uh, a little bit here and there. I think I have a couple no. of more years where where it's going to come up, and uh, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. but but it's like the last little quarter of my life. I, I've been carrying around so many ideas in my head. It's like I have. It's like I have a lot of dough on the rice, and all of a sudden now it feels like they're ready to go into the oven. My own ideas, and some of them come out like horrible, and some of them come out like pretty good-looking cookies. So that's what I'm doing now. I've been writing a lot, a lot of scripts, and we, we're pitching scripts, me and my little company. I have a couple of people I work with. So I've always thought in my career, the last years of my life, I'm just going to do the things I really love and the ideas I carry around in me. Like I said, it's never too old. You're never too old to start a rock band. Like the ideas I carried with me since I was 16, 17 years old that I now want to turn into movies or whatever. Beautiful. I, I think a, that's, I an that's, the, uh, that's the episode, Jim, don't you think? It's never too yeah. late to start a rock band. I mean, that is a take, that's a takeaway. I just, yeah. I just had a beautiful inspiration moment of what, and I'm all about, you know, funny viral type videos. I think you should reprise classic Peter Stormare roles in Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> And just replace different characters. <laughs> you know, Where is the pancakes interest. house? <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> you know how like Kevin James, have you seen what Kevin James is doing? What's he doing? No. I love you know, the like King of Queens. He, he's, he's inserting himself in classic movies as either like the sound guy holding a boom mic. And, you know, he's got, you know, in like uh, the notebook. 
in that classic yeah. scene where they're in the rain and he's asking her, what do you want? And he's going, I just need a sound check, Mr. Mr. Gosling. I just, just please give me a sound check. <laughs> what do you want? I, Mr. Gosling, all we need is just a quick sound check. <laughs> It is. It's hilarious. Wow. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I love <laughs> him, man. Kevin James. Oh, it's, oh he's, it's he's great. I love broad comedy. I'm a sucker for a multicam comedy. I know it's going out of fashion, but you know, yeah. I, you know, I love it. Me too. I think, <laughs> you know, the clown or the crazy guy, he wants to be a clown too. You know, it's, yeah. it's, I, I love humor and I, I love a good laugh. I like to be funny. And that's what I build, try to build into all my dark characters, some little enigmatic question mark that I flip and it becomes a hook. Ah. You know, like the Spanish question mark. It's a hook more than a question mark. Yeah. But I try to get the viewer interested, even if this guy had killed somebody, mm-hmm. that they want to know more about him. They wouldn't mind sitting down having a coffee with him just to hear the rest of his right. story. So they don't get intimidated and shun away from the screen. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you got to do it with a little twinkle in your eye. You are you a know. deep guy, man. Well, you do. Probably you do, really my friend. Deep. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I am. I am. I, I, a little bit of a philosopher that loves to laugh. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. That's and I, yeah, we, we could have a, a heck of a cup, cups of coffee together and yeah. discuss many of Beer, you know the good, uh, good old story when it where, comes to faith where the guy, <clears throat> guy comes to the guy that's a good old story uh, you might have heard it but the guy who comes to the you know psychologist and sits down and the psychologist says well, what's the problem and he said I'm, I'm getting suicidal I, everything you know is so dark in my life and I, uh, I I don't know what to do I really need help to solve the problems in my life and the psychiatrist says, well, I, I think I have a remedy. You know, there's a circus in this town. And I, 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 I would, I've been there a couple of nights. And I, I'm going to take you to the circus. And you're going to see this clown. And this clown is fantastic. You know, he makes me laugh, so I forget about tomorrow. And the guy across the table said, but, sir, I'm that clown. Mm. Boom. Boom. <clears throat> boom. Jim, do you have a boom soundtrack on uh, a sample I on there? I have. Uh, hold on. He, he, Jim is so entranced what was happening today, he didn't do any sound effects. Uh, <laughs> what was that? Well, hey, so tell me what, what's this space monkey from outer space? Is that all your safe and sanitized gear? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's something that uh, me and my wife, uh, we've been married many years and she's from Japan and We've been creating since we have a daughter together. She's 11 now, but we started when she was three, four years old. And I had a story that is called the space monkey from outer space. I started telling her and then I wrote it down. My wife is a great cartoonist, anime, and she created all this like little space monkey and his friends and all his caricatures and all this beautiful little living creatures from outer space. So now we open up a a web shop and we work with a company called the Brothers Marshalls out in Malibu. We're going to be in a store. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, no one is, you know, you can't get a T-shirt anymore. You can't print it. Everything's been closed for nine months now. Ah. So I'm fortunate and it's still closed. So it's a little bit (laughs) bad timing. But he's going to get out there with more music and, and there's Space Monkey music too. He does music. Wow. So uh, if you, you're going to get it, Space Monkey music and Space Monkey gear. It's, it's a lot of cool things coming up. And she's a fantastic. She can draw anything. And it's cool. It's all about this monkey from outer space. And he loves Earth. He doesn't understand people, but he, he loves foliage you know the leaves just to lay in a meadow and see the leaves because they don't have that in outer space where he's from no and he's trying to understand what human beings are all about why they're running around like crazy when they can just watch the leaves move and rustle yeah 
Yeah, well, surely we're not the only life on this, like on a planet. There has to be some other people watching us out there going, these idiots. But yeah, people can learn more about that. Click the link at uh, the real Storm Air <laughs> yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, on Instagram. Yeah, I'm all on Instagram. It's like, I can't be on Twitter. It's so many angry people. You say something and you oh get my gosh, you're right. so, so much anger and I, I can't even watch it anymore. All the, all the production companies wanted you to tweet before or Facebook, but now they like Instagram. Just yeah, just do, yeah, do Instagram. Did you hear about um, um, Tom Cruise? He lost his cool on the set of Mission Impossible 7 because someone yeah. broke COVID uh, protocol and he went off and then Clooney defended him. And it's like, you know, maybe I'm a couple of days behind now, but I just saw that on the net, so... No, I heard it, yeah, on NPR, and it's it's like <laughs> like someone called in an NPR and said, you know, he's doing the right thing, but, but, you know, what about us? I'm working as a nurse, a male nurse, you know, and we were just screamed at uh, from our supervisors to wear the same PPE for five days in a row during the pandemic. So... Uh, all of a sudden this comes into the news when we've had this for nine months where we are dying, trying to save a lot of lives, but we ourselves are dying. Yeah. So my thoughts are going out to all the people working in you know, hospitals and, Absolutely. and all the retirement housing and senior living and, and rightly so, because when you shoot a movie, you should hold the restrictions. It's, I've done two movies now on the COVID and it's very, very important that everybody heed to the rules. And mm -hmm. he could have done it in a more graceful sure. way, I guess. I guess, I mean, if one person breaks the rules, it puts everybody at risk. I mean, it really... Yeah, you know, to close down a production for a week, I know it happened to a couple of friends of mine in Europe. They had to close it down. And no bond company gives an insurance anymore. If it's COVID, you have to pay for it yourself. Wow. So, so that's why a lot of people don't want to shoot, you know, uh, unless they have some kind of guarantee, like a buffer zone. If it's closed down, so at least we can make one or two weeks, we can close it down and come back. Yeah. But you have, to, you have to have that in the budget from the beginning. And that's why he said is we're like a thousand people working, depending on this movie. The people are, can lose their jobs, you know, and, and we, we should... Just listen to the rules and regulations. We're all trying to walk through this together. So rightfully, he could have, as I said, addressed it differently. I would have taken them to the side and said something. Yeah. Or tell the producers to, you know. But of course, it's rightly. We, we should all listen to the scientists these days and not to other crazy people. But I, my heart goes out to all the people in the hospitals that doesn't have the standard PPE and can't get the right masks. And we're all tricked into think the vaccine's going to solve it all, but we have to ride this out. Yeah. Our ancestors rolled everything out so we could be here. I'm sorry, getting into deep waters again, but no, no, it's, it's, fine. Absolutely. Well, man, I so much appreciate you spending this time with us. I'm a massive fan, and I hope that this all goes away and society comes back one day and we can all get together and be creative and maybe we can make music together at someday yeah, in Los Angeles. Absolutely. Love, yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Make contact when you come out here again. Absolutely. I would love to see it. Fantastic. I'll be out second week of January in the new year, 2021. As always, Jim McCarthy. There, yeah, they're right there. There's the minimalism right there. <laughs> That's as busy as it gets. Jim, I love you, man. Thank you for your time and talent. We always have a good time. We get to do this with Mark Shepard next, the actor from the TV uh -oh. show Supernatural. Have you ever encountered Mark? No, 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 no. We haven't. No, but I know. No, not, yet. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Someday. Well, thanks so much again, man. Happy, happy holidays and stay safe. We'll you see too. you soon. And to all the listeners out there, thank you so much for listening to The Rich Redmond Show. We got an email address, questions, comments, Show at gmail.com. And as always- oh, Shout out to Harry. Oh, that's right, Harry. If you're <laughs> running right now, thanks for listening to our show. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. And thank you, Jim. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.